You may be seated. God bless you. So good to see all of you today. We're glad you're in the house. I've often said that if peace was something you could sell and there was a store that you could visit to get peace, the line would be wrapped around the block. How many understand there's really nothing, nothing really better than peace? You say, well, pastor, I don't know about that. I think love is the greatest. Well, we know the scripture says the greatest of these is love, but how many know it's impossible to have love if you don't have peace? No one has ever, may I remind you, no one has ever said it's so peaceful around here, I just think I'll have to get a divorce. How many still with me? No one has ever said in any family situation, I just can't stand, this is just too peaceful. We're just, we just need to have some controversy. You are literally twisted if you like conflict. Amen? The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace breakers. Amen? Blessed are the peacemakers. So the title of today's message is A Quiet and peaceable life. How many think that sounds like a really good goal? A quiet and peaceable life. How many have ever just said, I just need some peace and quiet? Every mama has uttered those words. And sometimes some grandparents as well. But everybody at some time in their life has said, I just need a little peace and quiet. How many know some people have gone on vacation searching for peace and quiet? And a lot of times they didn't find the peace and quiet because they took the source of the unrest with them. One man went on vacation and he wrote a postcard back to his therapist and said, having a wonderful time, wish you were here to tell me why. Well, <laughs> That is, that's what's wrong when people depend too much on what someone else thinks or what someone else can speak. Or, you know, we're, we're in a day and hour where life coaches is the, is the rage. Everybody seems to have a life coach. I guess if, you know, if you don't have one, maybe you don't have enough money or whatever. I, uh, I don't have one. Uh, I, I have the Holy Spirit as my life coach. And He doesn't charge me. Amen? But you've got a lot of, it's, it's like the rage, the life coach, and we need this one and we need that one. Well, you know, many things that any so-called life coach would tell you is basic common sense things that if you just sat and was still for just a little while and you read the Word of God, you would come to the same conclusion. We have people today getting business degrees in business colleges and they're taking courses on business ethics and everything they're being taught in business ethics they should have learned in Sunday school in their primary class. The golden rule, keeping your word, being a person of integrity, being a person that can be depended upon. If you get it out, put it back. If you turn it on, turn it off. All of these just very simplistic things. It doesn't take $50,000 a year and go off to some place and live in a dorm and have your senses assaulted to find out the common sense things of life. I submit to you today, the Bible remains the biggest and greatest and best life coach of all. Within its covers are the words that will keep us in every situation. I believe this with all of my heart. There is nothing that's going to face your life that if you earnestly seek God and look into the Scriptures, you won't find an answer for. In fact, unlike some stores that have boasted, I've walked in some stores and they said, if, if, if we don't have it, you don't need it. Well, that's debatable. But I can tell you this. If it's not contained in the Word of God, you don't need it. His words are, pro are promised, are true, and forever settled. 
throughout the ages. And so as we look at this today, the goal of a quiet and peaceable life, how many know the world is in turmoil? Everywhere you look, there's people that are trying to agitate. They're trying to point out all of the differences instead of the similarities. They're trying to seize on something that doesn't matter, straining at a gnat, so to speak, and swallowing a camel, as Scripture says. You know, it's time that we focus on the things that really matter. I like what someone said. They said, keep the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing? To love God with all your heart and to love your neighbors yourself. What would happen tomorrow if everybody started treating each other like they wanted to be treated? What would happen tomorrow if instead of people scheming to try to take advantage of someone, they were trying to create a situation where everybody wins? And how many know everybody does win when you follow the principles of God's Word? I've said this so many times, and let me say it one more time. God does not have to rip somebody else off so you can be blessed. He's not that small a God. He's able to bless you and bless them as well. And you honor His principles, and He'll honor you. Amen? You do the things that are right, and He'll bless you. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead. In his days the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods, and the high places, and broke down the images, and cut down the groves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. Also he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places, and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest." Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities, and make about them walls, and towers, gates, and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought Him, and He hath given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. I want to focus on that statement, that phrase, We have sought Him, and He has given us rest on every side. God is a God of peace. In fact, one of His names is Prince of Peace. I just ask you today, you know, we live in such a frenetic, fast-paced, frenzied society. We feel like we don't have enough time for this or that or the other. And listen, I'm preaching to all of us, myself too. But what would happen? What would happen if we just took a third of the time that we're spent worrying and stressing and getting upset about things that we can't change, and we started praying that amount of time. What would happen? God can move on people's hearts, and He can give them peace when you can't do anything about it. God can literally change their heart like no one else can. My Bible tells me that when, when, when a man's ways please God, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing if you walk such a life with the Lord and you're pleasing before Him that He just causes the enemies just to dissolve before you? How many could just stand about six months of stress-free, worry-free, enemy-free living? You could just stand some peace. You could just stand at just no conflict. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, you, you, you drive into schools and it says you're entering a drug-free zone. Well, it don't stop the drugs, unfortunately. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could just put a sign up at your house, you're now entering a conflict-free zone. I'm convinced with all of my heart it's the enemy's plan and plot to turn our homes into battlegrounds so there's no place where there's peace. There's stress in the workplace. There's stress in, 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 in the environment as a whole and dealing with everyday things that you have to deal with. Many times, things that you have no control over will invade your life. 
I like the way one man prayed. He said, Lord, he said, I want to thank you for this day. He said, I haven't gotten upset with anybody. I haven't raised my voice. I haven't gotten excited. I haven't cut anyone off in traffic. I haven't gotten angry. He said, but now I'm about to get out of bed and I really need your help. Listen, you, you really need His help. You really need His help. You can do something in a fit of anger that you can pay for for the rest of your life. Are you hearing me? You know, don't say, well, it's not that bad. You know, I just get upset sometimes. I just lose my temper sometimes. It only takes one time to destroy your life. He that keeps and rules his spirit is greater than he that takes a city. Hello? Thank God for peace. Thank God that we can live a peaceful life. Notice that 2 Chronicles 14.7. Guess what? If you do 7.14, you get 14.7. What is 7.14? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their sin, will heal their land and forgive their sin and heal their land. Isn't that awesome? That's a promise. How many know our land needs healed? Our land needs healed. We need to pray against everyone who's trying to divide and trying to, to just destroy and conquer. We need to pray against the spirit of division. We need to pray for unity. Unity in our homes. Unity in our country. Unity in our churches. I'm convinced that when the enemy saw what happened on the day of Pentecost, I believe... He had a council in hell that said, we can't allow that many people to ever get in one mind and one accord again. We need to be in one mind and one accord. How can we be in one mind and one accord unless we believe the same book and serve the same God? And if we do that, we'll be well on our way. And thank God that there is a spirit of peace. There's a fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruits is peace. Can I get a witness? And so... We can influence our destiny and control it to a degree if we'll just be people of prayer. To trust Him completely and follow Him wholly will lead to a quiet and peaceful life. I like what 1 Timothy says in 2, 1 Timothy rather chapter 2, the second chapter. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Thank God we have those promises in His Word. We are exhorted to pray for those in authority. We're exhorted to pray. Listen, I believe this with all of my heart. You and I are called to be salt and light. As the church goes, so goes the nation. You can't just sit around and decry and criticize everything that's wrong and not do anything to make a difference. You are called to be salt and light. You're called. Maybe we would have a little more peace if we just start doing what we're supposed to do. How many know salt isn't any good until you shake it out of the... What good is it if you have all the answers and you're not giving them? But you know, before you can really speak into somebody's life, you need to kind of earn their respect just a little bit. You need to establish some type of relationship. You get to the place where they have some confidence in you and some confidence in your word. And then God can use you by His Holy Spirit to speak truth into their life. And only truth can make them free. Can I get a witness? In 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 11, Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, rather with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord. Thou art our God. Let no man prevail against thee. 
So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. So God will deliver us if we call on Him and put our trust in Him. Thank God. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. I want to say it again. 100% of all the prayers you never pray never get answered. Did everybody hear what I just said? 100% of the prayers you don't pray never get answered. There's a lot of people who say our thoughts and prayers are with you and they'll never pray five seconds. You know, there's some people, well, you know, God didn't do anything about that. Well, did you pray? Did you pray? I was preaching in Canada. And at the end of the service, and this is not something I did on a regular basis, okay? I tried to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I fear God. I don't try to just make up stuff and, and say it. I, you know, I, that's... Uh, that's just unthinkable. But as I came to the end of the service, I felt the Spirit of God prompt me, and I said, there's a person here today that... Oh, actually, I said it this way. How long will you isolate yourself from those that love you the most? How long will you isolate yourself? And... I knew who the person was. Never met him before in my life. And again, did something that I didn't do very often. But after I'd given the altar call and invited people to come forward to pray, I went back to where that lady was. And I said, ma'am, can I, can I pray with you? She said, uh, only if you don't touch me. Well, that's fine. But I said, well, would you like to come forward? No, someone will lay hands on me. I just, I don't. And uh, then she said something that I just found really troubling. She said, she said, God don't love me. I pray to him all the time and he don't answer my prayer. And here, I asked the pastor, I said, What's with that lady? Again, like I said, I don't norm I didn't normally do that. He said, let me tell you. He said, you are the third preacher to come here and speak directly to her need. She has a phobia of anybody touching her. She's a germ freak. She won't even let her own family touch her. She won't even let her own husband embrace her. And you, at the end of your sermon, said, how long will you isolate yourself from those that love you the most. He said, you nailed it. Again, something very rare. Never, didn't do this a lot. But I talked to her again. And I said, how can you say God doesn't love you? When he sent somebody from another country, how many understand Canada is another country? United States is another country. I said, how can you say God doesn't love you and doesn't hear your prayers? He sent somebody from another country to speak directly to your need. He wants to set you free. We can get wrapped up in all of these crazy fears and phobias and all of this stuff that's just a trick from the, from the pit of hell when all the time God desires for you and I a quiet and peaceable life that can be found when we're filled with His Spirit because as I said, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. But you've got to believe He hears you when you pray. And you've got to accept the Word of God when you hear it. I wish I could report to you some great success. She didn't totally change. She just continued to stick with her false premise that God didn't love her and didn't care about her. And how many people there are today that the devil has told them that line, they've bought into it. And they can't seem to get past it. I was preaching another revival in the state of Maryland. There's a couple hundred people there that night. And again, this isn't something that I did hardly ever while I was preaching. You know, preaching is... The time when I speak and you listen, it's not an interaction like Bible study or questions and answers or whatever. And I was preaching and I was 
walking back and forth a whole lot more than I do now, you know. So if I make you dizzy now, just fix your eyes on one spot. I'll be back through there in a minute. Okay. Jesus is too good to talk about standing still. But I actually stopped in front of this lady. And I said, God loves you. He really does. He really loves you. After the service, she came to me. She looked like she'd swallowed a light bulb. And I'd watched her when she came in that night. She was just totally, completely depressed. She was one of three sisters. They had rode to church together that night on the way to church. I want you to hear this. On the way to the church, this lady, her name, first name, Lenora, told her two sisters, God doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. And right in the middle of my sermon, I walked right up to where she was sitting and said, God loves you. He really does. It changed her life. From that day forward, every time we saw her, she had a huge smile on her face. She came to a whole lot of meetings that we had in that area. Just one word of truth from the power of the Holy Spirit can break the chains of the enemy, can take away all the lies of hell off of your life and give you the peace that you need. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one that can make the difference in your life. Let's look back at 2 Chronicles in chapter 15 as this story continues to unfold. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you, but if you forsake him, he will forsake you. How many th think that sounds pretty straight up? I mean, that's, that's pretty simple. It's not rocket science. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought Him with their whole heart, their whole desire rather. And He was found of them and the Lord gave them rest round about. But guess what? Later, in spite of all the history of God's faithfulness with Asa, He turned to other sources for help in time of need. I just want to let you know straight up, God is a jealous God. And it's not the kind of petty jealousy like you and I think. It's a jealousy born of an incredible love that loved you so much He gave Himself for you. It's a, it's a, it's a love so deep and so powerful because if you're born again, you're twice His. Once His by creation and again by redemption. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. You're to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Your body is to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not just here to do your own thing. It's not just everything you like. Amen? How many know sometimes you need to do things you don't like? It's called discipline. Sometimes you even need to eat things you don't like. Don't everybody shout yes at the same time. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll reach over on my wife's plate and eat a piece of broccoli that I really don't like just because I know it's good for me. And she says, here, have some of my... So I'll reach over and grab a tree and eat part of it just because I know it's good. Amen? Well, what happens spiritually when all you want to do is just hear something that tickles your ears? What happens spiritually when you never want to grow and you never want to be stretched and you never want to just go beyond where you are and let God take you to a higher level and a deeper depth? Listen what happens in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 as this unfolds. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Benadad king of Syria that dwelt at Damascus saying, There is a league between me and thee as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Benadad hearkened unto king Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Ejon and Dan and Abelmaim and all the cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof wherewith Baasha was building, and he built therewith Jeba and Mizpah. And at that time 
Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord, listen to this verse, this is powerful. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth or angry with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. You know, this is, the, this is the great challenge of trying to preach the Word in the day and hour we live. When you tell people the truth, sometimes they'll get mad. Listen, if I say something that steps on your toes because you're not living right, get mad at yourself. Don't get mad at the one who's trying to help you. Asa should have got mad at himself. Can I get a witness? He's the one that turned to the arm of flesh instead of God who had never failed him. He's the one that took money out of the church. He took the gold and silver from the temple and used it to pay a mercenary army to come deliver him when all he had to do was call on God. When are we going to get back to the simplicity of the faith that is in Christ Jesus when all we need to do is call on Him? Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in this and some trust in that and some trust in wisdom and education and knowledge and everything else. But at the end of the day, we're all going to come as a little child and trust Him in faith believing that His promises are yes and amen to a thousand generations of them that believe and know Him. And if you do that, friend, you're going to be successful. If you do that, you're going to triumph. You know, I'm often... Just a little sidebar, but I'm, I'm often like amazed and amused at the same time when someone will say, well, you know, we just, at our church, we just talk only from the New Testament. Well, you know, that's just really, not only is it short-sighted, it's extremely simplistic and ignorant. Because when Jesus was here and walked among us, the only thing He preached from was the... I, I, look, I don't have a problem with the Bible being broken into the Old Testament, the New Testament, and there's chapters and verse divisions. Because if we didn't have that, I would have to have a couple men out of the congregation roll out a big long scroll, and I'd have to walk down 14 feet and go down a certain line, and I'd have to probably try to memorize where that was on that scroll so I wouldn't hold you up, and it'd be really hard and difficult to do. But I do think God never intended for us to just to divide this Bible in two pieces and only look to one piece. The Old Testament shows me the character and nature of God. I may not be bound by the ceremonial law, which I'm not, but every moral law that was given in the Old Testament is still in force today. The God who said, Thou shalt not steal, still doesn't want you to stick. Can I get a witness? The God that said thou shalt not kill still doesn't want... Do I have to recite all ten? Jesus said, I came not to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. He's come to write the law on our hearts. He's come to put that law in us. Listen, when you truly get saved and you get born again and you get filled with His Spirit, you don't have to have 14 policemen walking around watching everything you do all day long. You will become a police to yourself through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You will automatically do the right thing because it's inside you to do the right thing. And no free society can exist. When men become so corrupt they have to be policed 24-7, society will collapse. And sadly, we're racing towards that now. No, for, That's why you've got dictators all over the world. That's why you've got police states because these people are living in darkness and they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit to help them live a godly life. Listen, just because I'm free to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And let me take it another step. 
even if it's even legal in the eyes of man and a secular legal system, if it's wrong according to the Word of God, I shouldn't be doing it. At the risk of beating a dead horse, it needs to be said anyway. Just because abortion is legal does not mean in any way it is right. God is the giver of life. And life is sacred. That's above your pay grade. You're not supposed to be playing God. Since when did a woman have a right to choose who lives and dies? That, that is so crazy. That is such a bogus lie. That is such a bogus line. A woman's right to choose. Well, it's a 50% chance you're going to kill another woman. Somebody shout now. Did you hear what I just said? It's a 50% chance you're going to kill a future woman. And talk about the ultimate racism. You want to hear the ultimate racism? The majority of your abortion clinics are in minority neighborhoods. And the majority of abortions are performed on minority people. And you want to holler racism. What a lie from hell. Listen. Let me just... Look, hey, no charge for the extra meat. I won't say that today. But let me, just, let me just quote. And I'm not endorsing everything the man did or said or whatever. I don't even know everything the man did or said. But I will agree with this one statement. Martin Luther King said, I long for the day. I long for the day when a man is judged by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. And that's the way it ought to be for all of us. It don't matter what color you are. It matters what's inside your heart. And the people who claim to be against racism are the most racist of all. They're all the time hollering race. If the first thing you always see is race, something's wrong with you. You ought to see the heart of a person. You ought to hear what they're saying. You ought to see how they act. You ought to judge them according to their fruits. I can't change the color of my house very well, but I can change the behavior inside this house. Somebody shout yes. You know, all of that is just so ridiculous. You know, actually, I, I, hardly, I hardly like to even dignify taking any time to talk about it. But why, how, how, how superficial? How so not what it's about? Man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. Wow. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Are your words producing peace? The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Do you have the gift of just making everybody mad you meet? Are you a peacemaker or a peacebreaker? And may I just suggest to you, that doesn't mean sometimes that people don't need to be told the truth. But we have to speak the truth in love. Hello? Truth is powerful stuff, so we've got to try to say it in love. You know, I, I wish I could tell you I learned this straight out the gate as a brand new baby Christian. But you know, it took me a number of years before I realized I could be right in principle and wrong in my spirit and still end up being wrong. Well, bless God, I told them the truth. Yeah, but did you tell them with any love at all? Did they even hear what you said or did they just watch your actions? Uh, uh, hello? Did, did they even hear what you said? Or did they just see your angry expression and your total contempt for them as a human being? A wise man once said that Nobody really cares about what you know until they know you care. Yeah, maybe we need to earn the right to speak into some people's lives. And maybe by bringing our heart full of peace, 
that's been washed by the blood of Jesus into a highly volatile situation, we can just calm the whole thing down. Wouldn't you be just, wouldn't you just love to be known as a peacemaker? Wouldn't you just be, wouldn't it just bless you to know that you can walk into a highly charged situation and you can speak the words of truth in love and calm the whole thing down? Wow. Second Chronicles 16, 12, and Asa in the 30 and 9th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the 1 and 40th year of his reign. How sad. He never humbled himself. He never received the reproof of Hananiah the seer. All he did was got angry, rejected the prophet, oppressed other people. Listen, friend, the true measure of your character is when you are told the truth about a situation and you humble yourself and say, good is the word of the Lord. The true measure of your character is when someone looks you in the eye and says, you know something, what you're doing is not right. Not only is it not right, it's destructive. And if you keep it up, it's going to destroy you. And you say, you know something, I thank you for that. I thank you you cared enough to tell me the truth. You know, we say we love people, but I wonder how much do we really love them? Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't love them enough to tell them the truth because you're afraid you'll lose them as a friend, then you really don't love them that much, do you? Well, I can't really tell them that. That's just going to upset them. Well, you know, I know they're headed for a train wreck, but I'm just going to sit back and let it happen. Well, how would you re be regarded if you knew the bridge was out and you just continued to wave traffic forward? How would you be regarded if, well, you know, I know they're all going to hell, but as long as I'm going to heaven, that's all that matters. What a selfish, myopic, myopic me-centered, terrible way to live. You haven't been given this treasure in earthen vessels just to keep it to yourself. I don't care how much talent you've got if you've dug a hole and put it in the ground. What are you doing with what God's gifted you with? What are you doing? What are you doing to make the world a better place? What are you doing to make your immediate circumstance and situation a better place? Everybody can melt down. Everybody can get upset. Everybody, that's a, that's a carnal response. It's not hard to do. I can tell you how you can lose your temper and act like a jerk real easy. Just don't pray and read for about a day and a half. That's about all it'll take. Just to lay out of church and stop listening to the Word of God. You, it'll come to you natural. The old carnal mind will, man will raise up. The man that's supposed to be crucified with Christ will rise back up. Can I get a witness? Somebody said the problem with the living sacrifice is it tries to crawl off the altar. In the Old Testament, they said, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Well, in the New Testament, we have to be daily crucified with Christ. Not, not I live, but Christ lives in me. I've got to put the old man down in his deeds. I've got to resist the temptation to always just like do what I feel. Can I just be real honest with us today? If every one of us had given in to our feelings at this point in our life, there would probably be nobody here today, including your pastor. We would all be in jail for murder or attempted murder or attempted assault or some really bad thing. Now, I wonder how many could just say, Pastor, sometime in my existence on this planet, before I knew the Lord and hopefully not after I knew Him, I have been angry enough to like wring somebody's neck and really seriously hurt them. And if I'd have given in to that, I wouldn't be here today. I'll see about, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14. I'm going to keep standing here till more hands go up because I don't want to preach online for half an hour. But I'm going to tell you something. If you just come on now, I, we're almost there. Come on, I'm looking for 100%. Because I just, you know, I just don't believe you're this all that laid back that nothing's ever bothered you. 
The devil's never tempted you in any way to get upset with anybody. But daily, I've got to put that old man and his deeds down. If Paul said, I die daily, and he wrote the biggest part of the New Testament, what do you think you and I need to do? This thing's not all about me, my, and I, and what I want, and my needs, and my whatever. You know, it's funny, the things that set out, stand out to you in the pattern of your life. It's just, it's crazy. It, it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's almost like just amazing and perplexing how a person's mind works. I could literally take you back to a spot in the road on Route 17. As a little boy of five years old, sitting on my mama's lap, coming home from church on a Sunday night. And I asked my mama if we could do something and I could have something. And she said, we'll see. You're not the only pig in the puddle. Now that was my mama's nice, colorful way of letting me know I was not her only offspring. But it went over my little five-year-old head because I thought I was it. And I remember asking my mama, who are the other pigs? If I was in a puddle, I want to know who was in there with me. But can I just tell you today, you're not the only pig in the puddle. There's other people. And you're to be concerned where they're going. You're to be concerned about their soul. And if you have the answer, you need to be in here helping us give them the answer. Listen, 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 9. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdom of the land, kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. Check this out. The teaching of the word of God brought peace to the nation. Oh, for a revival of trusting God. Then we'll see peace break out like the noonday sun. Oh, for a revival of people hearing the words of truth. Oh, for a revival of people hearing that Jesus can set them free and break the chains of addiction. We have an opioid crisis in this country. We have a heroin crisis in this country. We're losing some... It's, the, the numbers are astronomical. I'm almost afraid to say it because I don't want to give you a, a, a wrong number, but it's just, it, it's literally, it's in the hundreds of thousands of people that are dying on a yearly basis from drug overdose in this country. And many of these drugs are coming in on the back of people called mules. They're human mules. They're, they're, they have backpacks full of drugs, full of heroin. They're crossing into our country. And these drugs are permeating our society. And listen, when one person gets addicted, it's not just that one person. A whole family is affected. All kinds of family members are wasting their money and pouring their resources and their time trying to get that one person addicted out of trouble before they're totally destroyed. It's the devil's insidious plan to turn this nation into a bunch of addicts and consume the time of the rest of us and all our resources to where nothing can be done of any lasting value or benefit. It's time for a revival of the holiness of God, of the righteousness of the Lord. It's time to repent. It's time to come back to God. It's time for a healing of our land and of our nation. And it's not going to happen if we don't call on the one who can make it happen. Jesus and Him alone. On Christ alone, I make my stand. In 2 Chronicles 18.30, Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him, saying, Fight you not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight, but Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. Notice, God moved them to depart from him. When we call on God, 
He can make our enemies change, hello, their course and our situation. Alter the outcome and transform your circumstance. Oh, I love that old hymn from yesteryear. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm going to keep saying it till you hear it in your sleep. He's to be our first choice, not our last resort. God is not supposed to be D or E or F or G on your multiple choice of your questions of life. He's to be A, right up front. You seek Him first in His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You seek Him and your life will be filled with peace. You seek Him and He'll come into the stressful situations and speak peace be still. How many could use somebody in the boat of your life when everything gets to rocking and rolling just to stand up and say, peace be still? Peace be still. Something's not wrong with this. You know, something's not, not right here. This is not, this is, look, let, let me just say this. You, you need to hear this. This is a principle. When something doesn't make sense in the natural, it means something supernatural is at work. Now, don't misunderstand what I just said. How many understand there is supernatural that's not good supernatural? When something doesn't make sense in the natural, something supernatural is at work. If something makes totally no sense whatsoever in the natural, then there's either a demonic component behind the scenes or there's a divine component that's moving something. Let me just give you a quick, quick illustration. It makes no sense for the nations of the world to hate the Jewish people. Six million died in Hitler's Holocaust in a war that killed 50-some million before it was all said and done. And yet we are forgetting the lessons of history even though we still have survivors of the Holocaust. There's not many of them left, but they still are walking around with the tattoo numbers of, of Treblinka and Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz, and yet we have wicked, evil people that say it never happened. It's all just concocted in these people's mind. They're trying their best to rewrite history, and they're spouting their anti-Semitic hatred, and there's actually a revival of anti-Semitic hatred in, in Europe, and it's, it's coming to a city near you. It's already happened here in America. We've got people in the halls of Congress spouting anti-Semitic statements that if they got in power, they would separate the nation of Israel from the nation of the United States and ensure the judgment of God on our country because God said, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. And God, you mark my words. Everybody that speaks against and does anything against the nation of Israel, God personally will will judge. I can walk you through history. Do you know in our war college, in, in, our, in our military schools, West Point, places of learning, war strategy, they won't even use Israel as an illustration because it doesn't make sense. Less than 48 hours old as a nation, less than 48 hours after the nation of Israel was born May 15, 1948. They were attacked on all sides by 650,000 well-armed Arab soldiers with the latest weaponry of their day. Israel had what was called the Israeli Defense Forces, what is still what their military is called today. They had some 65,000 volunteers, roughly of which... Only a third to a half even had a gun at all, and most of those were turn-of-the-century single-shot muskets, and they won. They won. You know why? Because there's a God in heaven that says, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to tell you something. He'll watch over every drop Every drop of Jewish blood, every drop of the descendants of Abraham. My wife and I did our DNA. I told you about it. 
last year. We just decided to do it. I, I just become interested. I'm a history buff anyway. I had never heard of Ashkenazi Jew until I read my DNA report. The Ashkenazi Jews migrated into Germany and settled along the Rhine River. Albert Einstein is an Ashkenazi Jew. It's a very small percentage Less than 1% of the world's population have any Ashkenazi Jew in them. And yet, wherever people have been scattered that are part of Abraham's seed, God has watched over them to do them good. But I got some real good news for you. You don't have to check your DNA. You don't have to do 23 in me or anything else. You can save your money. For if you be in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and join heirs according to the promise. Thanks be to God for us that were grafted in. Hallelujah. But I'm grateful to God for the little bit of Ashkenazi Jew I got in me. I love history. But guess what? It's not about where any of us come from that really matters. In the end, it's about where we're going. That's, that's what's going to count. Where will you spend eternity? Where will you? You don't want to be in a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. If you don't like screaming and yelling now, you don't want to go to hell. If you don't like fussing and screaming and loud noises now, you certainly don't. Hello, can I get a witness? That's not the place you want to go. I want a place of peace for all eternity. Amen? Let me finish this. You'll never go wrong trusting God. I love another old hymn of the church. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Man will fail you, friends will leave you, people will betray you, but Jesus will remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not affected by public opinion polls. He's not affected by the latest trend of culture. He's not affected by the latest style. He's not affected by the latest trend on Wall Street or any other street. He is Jesus, and His name is above every name, and at His knee, every at His name, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah! He reigns! And I want to rule and reign with Him someday. Guess what? He's promised. If we'll be faithful over a few things, He'll make us ruler over many things. Praise God. Would you be an instrument of peace? Would you go from here and be an instrument of peace? One man decided that he should be a saint. And so he decided... And I don't know why, but it's, a, it's amazing what people get all twisted in their mind, what the definition of a saint is. But he decided that to be a saint, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't leave the house and he couldn't really speak to anybody. So he just got a chair. And instead of just sitting in the chair, he actually put the chair on top of the table in the dining room. And he sat in it like he was sitting on a throne. He didn't move from it. And he just expected the rest of the family to wait on him hand and foot. And he wrote in his journal on the third day, he said, I have discovered that the most difficult place to be a saint is right at your own home. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm trying to say it's got to start at home, but it's got to be practical. Jesus said the greatest among you is to be servant. None of us are called to rule and lord it over one another. We're called to love one another with the same Spirit of Christ that He loved us with. And when they see our love, and they shall know you are my disciples, if you have love, one for another. Bow your hearts with me. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. I thank You that it is forever settled in heaven. It is a light to our feet, a lamp, to our feet and a light to our pathway. The same word that you preached, Jesus, and you spoke will judge us at the last day. 
We call on you today, Lord, Prince of Peace. Meet every need. So we reach out to you today. We'll give you praise. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed in reverence to God, not to this preacher, but just for a moment. I just want to ask you this question. Is there any area in your life you could use some more peace? Maybe you just say, Pastor, my life is just filled with unbelievable conflict. Everywhere I go, there just seems to be everybody's stressed out. Everybody's angry. I've got a highly volatile situation in my own family. I've got situations that I just don't know how, and I need God to make me an instrument of peace. I need to be a peacemaker. You put your hand up wherever you are right now. I see hands going up all over this church. I need to be a peacemaker. I need to be able to step in the middle of that situation and be used by God and be anointed by the Holy Spirit to bring peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now let me just say further. The first place, you're not going to be able to give anybody peace if you don't have peace yourself. And you can't have peace yourself unless you have peace with God through Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to take anything for granted today. Although I do believe we've got the faithful in the house today, those that know. And that's why I don't try to just do something just to be doing it, because if everybody knows, it's just an exercise. But let me just put it this way. How many can lift a hand without hesitation and say, Pastor, I've made Jesus my Lord and Savior, and I have peace with God because of what He did on the cross, and I'm living for Him. Put your hand up where you are right now. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Looks like 100%. Just about 100%. Listen, if you couldn't raise your hand and you don't know and you don't have that peace, that's why you're here today. And don't leave this place without making it right. Don't leave this place without doing something about it. It's not about just being a member of a church. That's great. We welcome that. That's wonderful. But a member don't save you. Only Jesus and His blood can save you. So if I miss somebody and you couldn't raise your hand, you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't have that personal peace. I don't have that assurance. You'd lift your hand where you are right now as we wait just a moment. All right. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank God. Thank God. Stand with me, everyone. Will you please stand with me today? Thank you, Lord. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to come and meet me here. We're going to pray a prayer blessing together. If you're new to this house, just watch the change of the color of the carpet. It means a change in elevation. But I'm going to ask you to come. Stand across this front. You get here first, just move up close so everybody can thank God for a good number here today in spite of the fact there's many that are still traveling and fighting whatever They may be fighting. We're glad you're here today. Now, you raised your hand a moment ago that you didn't have that peace. Let me tell you this straight up. Prayer is verbal communication with God. Meditation is thinking about God. Everybody say this with me. Meditation is thinking. Prayer is verbal. I don't know how many times. I, it, uh, hey, Jesus did say, when you pray, think. He said, when you pray, say. And I do believe in being a purist to the Word of God. Words mean things. When you pray, say. We're to open our mouth. For it's with your mouth confessions made unto salvation. That if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God of raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For if the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's your confession. It's your confession of faith in the finished work of Jesus, in His shed blood. That's... The Bible says that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's not the end, that's the beginning. That's what's wrong with too much of the church world today. We have a little spiritual baby 
and like leave them on the proverbial park bench. No, you take the baby home and care for it and love it and put it in an environment where it'll grow. And that's what's called church. Guess what? When everybody's raising their hand in the house, but one that we're all saved and all know Jesus, what's that mean? We need to go out and find some lost people and bring them in. That's what it means. It means we don't just sit here and say, well, that's good, we've all got it together. No, because we care about our loved ones. We care about those that are lost. But I want to just pray this prayer for those that may be later watching or even joining us now by live stream or podcast or whatever, or listen later by CD or DVD. I promise you, you already say it's not going to hurt you. Will you pray this prayer with me? And you who need to pray that prayer, you open your mouth and you pray it with sincerity today. God will he'll work it. Listen, hey, I'll never forget the day I said, God, I'm tired of running. Come into my heart. Felt like the load of the world lifted off of me. Things changed. It's called born again. Let's just pray together. Dear God in heaven, I come to you. I believe you sent your son Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. He paid a debt He did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. Lord Jesus, thank You for coming. Thank You for dying and rising again. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in Your blood and help me to be ready when You return. We thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer. Now, Lord, I bless this congregation. I pray you go before them and, and you, you make their path smooth. You make the crooked place straight. Watch over them. I pray your Psalm 91 blessing over their lives. Keep them from harm and danger and from pestilence and disease. And Lord, make us a blessing to those around us. Lord, help us that our light may shine to others and they see your good works, our good works, and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, Lord, bless, I pray, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're so glad you're here today. Come back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a great, great time in the presence of God. Take a moment, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck. We're glad you're here. God bless.